Hello and welcome to another edition of the VDA Going Virtual. We're proud to uh, bring to you today a, um, another series in our Back to Work Task Force. We've got with us uh, Dr. Vince Doherty, Dr. Frank Yarno, and Dr. Elizabeth Reynolds. We appreciate them joining us. Uh, this is a follow-up from our discussion we had um, back in May, where, as you know, we put out Back to Work uh, Task Force guidelines to help um, those returning to work. We've been back to work now for about six weeks, and the task force has updated those interim guidelines uh, to reflect the rate, latest recommendations and scientific research that's available. We've learned a lot uh, since those have been in place, and we really wanted to take the time to update them um, as we continue to get questions, and this um, whole thing we're going through continues to evolve and change and uh, as we learn more. So, we're excited to be able to offer you this brief discussion just to update you on what those changes are. And real quick, if you want to, we'd like to just go around and introduce uh, yourself. Um, so we'll start off with Dr. Doherty, if you wouldn't mind just introducing yourself, where you practice, and then uh, you know how things have been going back uh, in your practice. Great. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm Vince Doherty. Um, I practice up in Falls Church, Virginia, and I'm chair of the task force and past president of VDA a while back. Um, so up in Falls Church, we opened and things were slow at first. A lot of um, employees were a little anxious, especially the first few days, and have gotten much more comfortable as time has gone on. Um, the one thing I do notice is that some patients just don't listen. We send emails and tell them to stay in their car and um, they come in anyway sometimes, but that's the uh, one little negative, but we're getting there. Yeah, so I'm Frank Yerno, the uh, president-elect for VDA. I'm an orthodontist here out in um, West End of Richmond. And yeah, we're back to practice and we're about 75% of our normal um, patient flow. Uh, and Vince hit the nail on the head. It's the uh, logistics of getting patients in the office, in and out, maintaining social distancing, temperature checks, that sort of thing that is the probably the, the biggest obstacle to uh, kind of having a normal practice uh, life. So we're getting there, but it's it looks like it's here to stay for a little while. Hey, I'm Elizabeth Reynolds. I practice in Richmond as well. Um, I concur with the other gentlemen. We are definitely, our biggest issue is trying to make sure that we get folks in and get folks out in an efficient and effective and socially distanced manner. Um, we have been screening at our office, both on the phone and when folks arrive. I actually hired my daughter to do screening at our office, which has worked out pretty well. Gives her a job and certainly keeps her busy. Um, I think we're probably about up to maybe 80% now, but Patients do listen sometimes, but like Vince said, they don't always listen. We pre-screen them, we tell them what to do, they get there, they haven't done any of it. So it's all good. We're working with our new kind of screening process and getting folks in and out, and I think we're all getting adjusted. Well, I appreciate that. It, it, is, it has been an adjustment um, all around, and I know y'all have put in an enormous amount of time uh, putting together this uh, document and then also doing the updates. Um, a lot of research has gone into it. It's, you know, the VDA's role during all of this has been to really um, you know, take all of the information and things that are out there that are just free flowing constantly and trying to put them all in a, in a concise, unique manner for everybody to easily navigate it. And I, I've heard some of the best feedback from, from the work that the Back to Work Task Force has done um, with these interim guidelines, and I know that they've been helpful, so I know people will be um, looking for these updates as well. So um, going first to Dr. Doherty, um, where did you get most of the information and the resources um, and the data uh, that you've um, used to come up with these guidelines and, and the updates? Sure. Um, I would say probably the biggest and best resource we used was the ADA. We had Kirk Norbo, our trustee, on our task force, and he was the chair of the task force at the ADA. So that was very beneficial. Uh, they work closely with the CDC and OSHA, so we were able to get a lot, a lot of good information from them. Um, on our task force, we had someone from the board not acting on an official capacity, but the board of dentistry. So we had their 
insight into uh, what the Board of Dentistry was thinking. Um, more recently, we were working with the Virginia Dental Hygiene Association, which has been helpful. And um, I think we'll talk about that a little bit later with Donning and Dolphing. So they've given us some good information. Um, I think the other uh, great resource was everyone on our task force did an incredible job researching and, and uh, gave a lot of good information. And um, so we really um, got a lot of information from everywhere. Uh, Elizabeth Reynolds, our president, I know worked closely with the governor and the uh, Department of Health, so that uh, gave us a lot of good information there also. So the last thing is um, a lot of states were developing these guidelines at the same time. So we were following all the states and uh, comparing notes and uh, came up with what we thought was best. That's great. Yeah. And it is a, um, everyone's going through the same process. And so having the network of the dental associations um, in the states and being able to pull from them was was extremely useful. And I know a lot have been using ours, um, which is fantastic. So um, Dr. Yarno, we, uh, one of the elements in here that uh, maybe is a new term to some is the hazard assessment. Um, I don't wanna give anybody uh, heart palpitations as to <laughs> what that means, or does that mean more work? Um, what is that tool and uh, how can practices use it to assess their risk? So the hazard assessment is not to, nothing to be feared. Um, it's, it's an OSHA standard that we all need to comply with. In fact, we all do. We all have OSHA manuals in our office and we've all done hazard assessments on things like HIV, hepatitis B, needle sticks, et cetera. COVID is now just a new virus that we need to do a hazard assessment for. The purpose is to assess the risk that COVID presents to your employees. Remember, it's an OSHA standard. So uh, the ADA has put together a really good, concise document, uh, the ADA hazard assessment that we have a link to in our interim guidelines. And they divide up doing the hazard assessment into six sections, very, very simple um, and very quickly. Step one is to assess the risk that COVID presents to your local area. So data now is being given and broken down by the Department of Health in Virginia uh, by zip code. So it's really incumbent upon you to be checking that on some routine basis um, to make sure that you're not seeing an outbreak or a spike in COVID cases in your area. That's step one. Step two, inspect the workplace for those potential safety hazards. And, and these are included in the, in the interim guidelines. Um, you know, look for, for instance, magazines in your waiting room. Actually, seats in your waiting room have to be six feet apart and get rid of all the knickknacks and anything that could potentially harbor COVID. Um, step three is identify the health hazards of your employees. Now, we have a certain number of employees that are at higher risk than others, and maybe they should be placed in different places in the office to mitigate risk to, of transmission to those employees. Step four would be to make sure that you have a plan to uh, conduct incident investigations. If should somebody, a uh, patient, call back within uh, 48 hours and say that they're COVID positive, what do you do? Have a plan for that. Step five is to identify the hazards associated um, with emergency situations, which really just happened in our office last week. Um, you know, we all know what to do if, for instance, a patient um, starts to have, let's say, stroke um, symptoms in your office. But how does social distancing and the office logistics with waiting for somebody to come and emergency personnel to come. How does that all play into, how does COVID affect your emergency protocol? You should just discuss that with your employees so that they're not caught off guard. And the last one is implementation of these controls, which basically means follow the guidelines that we've put out there. So it's not difficult, but I would recommend that we all do the hazard assessment and then place a brief summary of what you've done in your OSHA manual. And some of that is important to keep good records. Is, is that... Oh, Absolutely. So it's just yet another section in the OSHA manual. Um, and the ADA has made it infinitely easy. So go to the link, download the document. It's maybe five pages. There's a checklist at the end. And then you can um, tailor that to your office needs and uh, just add it to your OSHA manual and you're good to go. Great. That's great. Well, I, I know that the hazard assessment um, can you know, immediately throw another wrench into some people's ideas, but it really is there to to add that extra layer of um, risk assessment 
uh, give you a place to go and a checklist. And again, it also is there to protect you so that you've got uh, documentation that you've done these things um, and you can show and prove it should you need to. And that's just important during these times to keep great records. Dr. Reynolds, on, on that note, we know that the, the, the hazard assessment um, is going to play a big role in how we can assess risk um, and, and make those treatment um, decisions. We've also heard some, um, we're offering some clarity around the screening questions, which we've gotten a lot of questions around how the screening questions um, apply and how decisions are made from those screenings that this uh, questions and then what treatment plans are, are put into place because of them. Um, if you could just elaborate a little bit on how you've been using the screening questions and then and then the appropriate way for those to be applied. Of course, thank you. Um, as I said, we screen folks 48 hours before and then we screen them again when they come to our to their appointments. The screening questions initially, I think, were maybe misinterpreted as an opportunity or a, or a potential for denying treatment or for not providing necessary treatment to folks who may have been exposed to COVID patients. That is not at all the situation. What we're trying to do is identify folks who might be at risk or who might put us at risk. When you look at folks like healthcare personnel, these folks who are caring for COVID patients in hospitals or in nursing homes are being provided the absolute appropriate PPE just as we are in our office. So we know that they are the best protected folks that we have. So when nurses or physicians come in or PAs come in who report that they've been caring for, been caring for COVID positive patients, though we don't need to deny them treatment and worry that they're going to be that they're going to transmit that to our personnel or our other patients they are absolutely protected and we need to make sure that we understand that we just today i had a patient who called and said that her husband has is being tested today because he is he has several of the of the symptoms of covid 19. we don't necessarily want that patient coming in he's going to be tested the test will come back positive or negative. She will likely be tested, and we want her to wait for that test before she comes into our office. Those are two very different situations, and that's how we're using that questionnaire in our office. That's a good point, Elizabeth, because the remember that we're seeing at least 20% of the population that we see and screen, screen negative, yet are positive. And that's the reason we use these standard precautions on every single patient we see. So a healthcare personnel, somebody on the front line who's been treating patients who has the proper PPE and is likely being tested at their office probably, or a hospital probably at least monthly, um, they are, as per CDC guidelines, a low risk uh, of SARS-CoV-2 transmission in your office. We have to be prepared for that 20% of asymptomatic positives that are always walking through our front door. Right, absolutely. And so from, from that, we can, we can uh, say that frontline medical personnel are considered low risk because of the PPE that they use on a daily basis, just like you do in your office. Um, and so we know that, that that puts them at low risk, which is great. And that, that will offer some clarity because I know we have gotten questions uh, related to that issue. Um, but Dr. Reynolds, you get to share some exciting news, I think, with folks um, on this next question we were going to talk about. Um, but the waiting time um, between patients um, had been put at 15 minutes uh, to allow for all the aerosols and droplets and things to fall and settle in the room, um, to clean, disinfect, and then um, change over. But is, is, is that still the case? So I do get to share some exciting news. Um, just yesterday, initially, the CDC had recommended 15 minutes, not between completion of aerosol and the initial and beginning of the next patient, but between dismissal of one patient and the introduction of the next patient, 15 minutes before you could even begin to clean the operatory to allow the aerosols to settle. They have just as yesterday backed off of that so that is no longer the recommendation. 
that makes sense that science isn't there to back up that 15 minutes. And we are doing such a great job with disinfecting our operatories between patients. We are allowing the appropriate time as needed for our patients. And the CDC has pulled that off. And so now we, know we are able to do what we have always done and appropriately disinfect our operatories between patients without a delineation of specific time. Moving on to the next question, Dr. Yarno. Um, we've noticed there's some changes in the mask section as well. Um, what are the highlights around that? So the changes we made to the mask section are, are pretty subtle. Um, anytime that a, an aerosol is being generated in the operatory, uh, the minimum requirement is a level three surgical mask with face shield um, can be replaced. The level three can be replaced with an N95 or a KN95. That is the bottom line. We had originally put in there that the minimum standard prior to SARS-CoV-2 was a level two uh, surgical mask uh, for those aerosol generating procedures, but we, we found that there was a lot of confusion around that. So as everybody is probably well aware, surgical level three with face shield or N95, KN95. Face shield is important because it does protect the mask and uh, since we are all trying to conserve on our use of these masks, um, preventing any kind of any kind of aerosol from reaching the outside of the mask is probably appropriate. So surgical level three face shield is minimum requirement KN95 and or 95 um, to replace the surgical level three is appropriate for any aerosol generating procedure. Dr. Doherty, we, on, on that front, we do know uh, uh, the N95 and the KN95 are um, certainly important to have and should you need them, uh, but you gotta have fit testing done, right? Need all of that. And if it doesn't, doesn't fit properly, uh, if you don't wear it properly, all of those things are important. So there's a section in donning and doffing of PPE in, in our new updates. If you would like to maybe elaborate a little bit on where that came from and some resources we used in that. Sure, absolutely. Um, yeah, on our initial guidelines, we did not have any information on donning and doffing, which uh, we, in hindsight, probably should have. So with this revision, we added to it. Um, there's a lot of information out there. We relied on the Virginia Dental um, Hygiene Association, who had resource for, resources from American Dental Hygiene Association. So they have great resources on donning and doffing and how you do it. The whole idea is to not cross-contaminate, obviously, and you would think it's common sense, but um, it really makes sense to look at this um, information and just step-by-step step to make sure you're not uh, cross-contaminating. And so a couple things about it are that uh, sequencing is important. So uh, one thing at a time, just follow the regimen and how to do it is important um, and then where to do it. So I would definitely recommend that you look at these donning and doffing um, guidelines and it will help you out. Now we're talking a little bit about the PPE and we know how to avoid um, getting contact or having anybody spreading of, of COVID-19. Can you talk a little bit about the new resources if a patient reports that they have COVID-19? Yes, absolutely. So yeah, in our new uh, updated guidelines, we basically link to the ADA, which has incredible resources on this. So if, a, if you find out that a patient was COVID positive, um, you would just follow the guidelines. And a lot of it depends on whether they were in a, uh, what, who was close to that patient, whether you're in a low risk or high risk exposure situation. So um, in either situation, you'd be monitoring each employee, each doctor, um, and then depending on whether it was high risk or low risk, you would um, potentially stay home for 14 days in a high risk situation. An employee or a doc would only be considered high risk if he or she was not wearing appropriate PPE when they came into contact with this patient who then calls two days later that they have showed up positive. If you're wearing your PPE the entire time, you will not be considered a high risk uh, transmission. There, there are links from the ADA to CDC that gives even more information on that. Just follow up on that. Um, in the interim guidelines, the we ask um, that offices request their patients, let them know within 48 hours if they have tested positive or show signs or symptoms of COVID-19 uh, COVID or SARS-CoV-2. 
um, infection. So it's if a patient calls you and it's two weeks later, uh, there's no reason to do contact tracing in your office. It's 48 hours or less if they call back, then you have to consider going back and looking for looking at that contact tracing. Anything more than that, it's a CDC recommendation that they don't need to call back. That's great. That's good clarity as well. So what happens uh, in an office and if a, um, a dental staff member or team member or the doctor um, tests positive for COVID-19? Yes, in that situation, the person that test positive for COVID would obviously have to stay home and, and quarantine. Um, and I think the rest of the office uh, would need to be tested. Um, and uh, the patients that were in contact with that particular healthcare practitioner should be contacted also. Um, if the office has all been wearing PPE all the time as they should be, the office would not necessarily have to close down. So let me, I'll, I'll throw out a scenario here and just see if y'all want to answer it because this is these are the questions that that we get and we you know want to want to be able to provide useful information to to answer those questions. Uh, let's say a team member tells you on a Friday that they have tested positive. Um, they they told you Friday afternoon they had their test Friday morning. Uh, they come right to you to let you know, hey, I've I woke up this morning, was sick, uh, not feeling well last night. I went and got tested. I'm, I'm positive. How far back in the, in the patient that, patients that you've been seeing over what period of time now do, do you need to contact um, that list of patients that that person has come in contact with? That is a question I've gotten multiple times. The answer to that question is, uh, it has to do with contact tracing. So just as we ask patients to contact our office within 48 hours, whether or not they've tested positive or showed signs uh, or symptoms of COVID-19, if we have a staff member or the doc, him or herself, comes back, test positive, the contact tracing goes back 48 hours. So you would contact the patients that you've seen in the previous two days. Well, that's great. That's all some really great information that I know we've been hearing from members on questions. So. Um, Finally, uh, I'm going to bring up a, a point with Dr. Reynolds and let everybody else chime in and make some last-minute uh, remarks if they would like to. Um, there's been some concerns uh, about the superiority claims when it comes to cleaning protocols and folks using that in, an, in a sense of advertising um, to gain a spot of superiority when um, some of those things that are being advertised have not been scientifically proven um, to be what they claim to be doing. Um, so how do we um, consider that in the ethical standpoints of, of how to practice and, and the advertising and things that go with the ethical side of dentistry? Um, I think first and foremost, superiority claims have always been unethical. We all know that any way, any time that you claim yourself superior to any of your colleagues, that is an unethical approach to advertising. So that first and foremost needs to be stated. There are claims we have seen, we've all seen the claims of UV lights or um, HEPA filters or um, there are other types of, of decontamination that are used by, that have been advertised and used by our colleagues to claim superior, superiority, and those just aren't valid. It's so important not to use those in your advertising and use those as an opportunity to claim superior of your colleagues because it's not happening. And I would also follow up with, there are a lot, there's an opportunity here for um, folks in our sales and marketing to claim some sort of superiority when they're selling you products. Um, and I just caution members to be sucked into things that aren't scientifically proven. Um, the reps that come by are there to sell. Um, and not anything, I don't wanna speak ill about any of them, but when there's science to prove it, that's when you buy it. So I would just caution folks about um, touting that superiority based on a claim that a rep comes in and says, oh, this is the best thing ever. We all know that they're there to sell products. 
That's a great point, Dr. Garneau. I do sometimes forget about that, but we do have folks that come in and try to sell us. They have opportunities, shall we say, for, um, for products that don't necessarily, aren't necessarily scientifically proven. Yeah, and it's, it's the rep's jobs. I don't blame them at all. I mean, they're given information by whatever the product rep tells them um, up and so forth up the chain. So it's really not at all their fault, but it's incumbent upon us as the, as the proprietor of the practice to, to rely on science to base those decisions, not just propaganda. I totally agree. And these folks are working to help keep us and our patients safe. Absolutely, they have our best interest at heart, but do your research. Couldn't do it without them, that's for sure. And one last point on that is the ADA is working on looking at the science behind all these products to see if they are actually effective or not. So just stay tuned and uh, don't claim superiority because we don't know anything about it at this point. Open it up and let anybody um, say a few words if you would like to on closing, just some thoughts about um, the overall work of the Back to Work Task Force, um, some specific takeaways from this. Um, I'll just go around the horn one last time if, uh, if you would like and um, some closing remarks on, on the importance of this. Um, you know, I, I have looked at this as, as just the pure proof is in the pudding of being a part of organized dentistry and what it means to come together and put out a document like this um, is exactly the reason for um, the VDA and for associations, professional associations like the VDA. So, um, you know, I, I view it as, as an unbelievable member benefit, even though a lot of uh, uh, the non-members have been taking advantage of it, and that's fine. We want, this is, this is important. This is a public health issue. Um, but no doubt this is hard work that has been put into by VDA members. And, and so I know a lot, of, a lot of people are appreciative of it. Um, but uh, Dr. Reynolds, I don't know if you have any closing remarks for us. Um, Ryan, I cannot thank Dr. Doherty and his group enough. The task, Back to Work Task Force has done an incredible job accumulating and com compiling all of this information, researching it, making sure it's appropriate and it's easily identified. And I cannot thank you enough for that, Vince, and for working and managing through all that. Um, I think the document speaks for itself, just like you said, Ryan, it's easy. You can look it up, whatever you need, it's listed. You can find a link to it. It's so important that we use this document. This is, this is what makes getting back to work safely easy. So thank you for your work, Dr. Doherty. Um, the, please, everyone out there, take a look at this document. It's updated. We will continue to update it as needed but it just may, it gives you all the information you need in one spot. Thank you. Dr. Yarno, any, any last words of wisdom? No, I think Elizabeth covered it all. We're, we'll definitely be doing some updates to the documents, so stay tuned uh, as the science, science unveils what we need to do, we'll, we'll update the document. And your questions are really helpful. So when you do call into the VDA and you have a question that really guides us as to what's missing, um, so please bring them. If we don't have the answer right there, that's, that gives us uh, more fodder for research. So it's good. And Dr. Doherty, as uh, chairman of the Back to Work Task Force, give you the last word and, uh, and, and close us out for the afternoon. Tell Elizabeth that I'm honored to have been chosen to take on this task. And I, I, I really am honored. I, you know, this is one of the most important things in my mind that, that, needs to be done and helpful to members and increases member value. And um, I mean, as I said, I was past president, this is much more important than any of that. And um, it's a difficult time for a lot of people and we're hopeful that this uh, can help make things a little easy for everyone. And I, I really truly thank everyone on the task force. They've been incredibly helpful. Everyone's really um, pulled forward and, and made it easy on me and, um, and come up with the great guidance for all the members. That's great. Well, thank you all for your time. Um, again, keep those questions coming. Uh, we will continue. This is a living document that will continue to get updated. And uh, as we have more information, more information will come out and we'll update it. And uh, stay tuned and thank you for tuning in.